Hey, Argument Ninja Dojo members, this is Kevin. And I want to share this video in advance of our next Zoom video meeting, which is coming up this Saturday, November 2nd, because I think it's a good seed for a discussion. And if you're watching this and you're not already a Dojo member, I'll explain more about what this is all about at the end of the video. Okay, during our last community video meeting, we talked about the usefulness of the martial arts metaphor for talking about critical thinking. And I mentioned Julia Galef's TED Talk, where she introduces the distinction between a soldier mindset and a scout mindset. And I think we can have a really good discussion about that springs off of this distinction because I think it captures something really important. And I think there's lots of room for disagreement about what critical thinking education should look like if you take it seriously. I'll link to the full video. It's only 12 minutes long, but here I'm going to play a few clips from it. So this is Julia's introduction to the distinction. So I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you're a soldier in the heat of battle. Maybe you're a Roman foot soldier or a medieval archer, or maybe you're a Zulu warrior. Regardless of your time and place, there are some things that are constant. Your adrenaline is elevated and your actions are stemming from these deeply ingrained reflexes, reflexes rooted in a need to protect yourself and your side and to defeat the enemy. So now I'd like you to imagine playing a very different role, that of the scout. So the scout's job is not to attack or defend. The scout's job is to understand. The scout is the one going out, mapping the terrain, uh, identifying potential obstacles, and the scout may hope to learn that, say, there's a bridge in a convenient location across a river. But above all, the scout wants to know what's really there as accurately as possible. And in a, a real, actual army, uh, both the soldier and the scout are essential. But you can also think of each of these roles as uh, a mindset, a metaphor for how all of us process information and ideas in our daily lives. And what I'm going to argue today is that Having good judgment, making accurate predictions, uh, making good decisions, is mostly about which mindset you're in. In the next section of the talk, Julia gives a 19th century historical case study, the Dreyfus Affair, uh, that illustrates these two different mindsets. But let's jump ahead and let her describe the psychological differences between the soldier and the scout, and in particular, the role that motivated reasoning plays in the soldier mindset. What does it say about the human mind that we can find such paltry evidence to be compelling enough to convict a man? Well, this is a case of what scientists call motivated reasoning. Um, it's this phenomenon in which our unconscious motivations, our desires and fears, shape the way we interpret information. So some information, some ideas, feel like our allies, and we want, we want them to win. We want to defend them. And other information or ideas are the enemy, and we want to shoot them down. So uh, this is why I call motivated reasoning soldier mindset. And probably most of you have never persecuted a French Jewish officer for high treason, I assume. Uh, but maybe you've followed sports or politics. So you might have noticed that uh, when the referee judges that your team committed a foul, for example, uh, you're highly motivated to find reasons why he's wrong. But if he judges that the other team committed a foul, awesome, that's a good call. Let's not examine it too closely. Um, or maybe you've read an article or a study that examined some controversial policy, like capital punishment. And as researchers have demonstrated, if, if you support capital punishment and the study shows that it's not effective, um, then you're highly motivated to find all the reasons uh, why the study was poorly designed. But if it shows that capital punishment works, awesome, it's a good study. And vice versa, if you don't support capital punishment, same thing. Um, our judgment is just strongly influenced unconsciously by which side we want to win. And this is ubiquitous. This shapes how we think about our health, um, our relationships, how we decide how to vote, um, what we consider fair or ethical. And what's most scary to me about motivated reasoning or soldier mindset is how unconscious it is. You know, we can think we're being objective and fair-minded and still wind up ruining the life of an innocent man. Okay, next, she talks about another historical figure involved in the Dreyfus Affair, Picard. And he represents for her the scout mindset in this case study. 
But again, I'll jump ahead to the part where she talks about what's distinctive about the psychology of the scout and how it differs from the soldier. So, you know, a lot of people feel like Picard can't really be the hero of this story because he was an anti-Semite and that's bad, which I agree with. But personally, for me, the fact that Picard was anti-Semitic actually makes his actions more admirable to me because he had the same prejudices, the same reasons to be biased as his fellow officers, but his motivation to find the truth and uphold it just trumped all of that. Uh, so to me, Picard is a poster child for what I call scout mindset. It's the drive not to make one idea win or another lose, but just to see what's really there as, as honestly and accurately as you can, even if it's not pretty or convenient or pleasant. And this mindset is what I'm personally passionate about um, and what I've spent the last few years uh, examining and, and trying to figure out what causes scout mindset. You know, why are some people, sometimes at least, able to cut through their own prejudices and biases and motivations and just try to see the facts and the evidence as objectively as they can? Uh, and the answer is emotional. So just as soldier mindset is rooted in emotions like defensiveness or tribalism, scout mindset is too. It's just rooted in different emotions. So for example, scouts are curious. They're more likely to say that they feel pleasure when they learn new information or uh, an itch to solve a puzzle. Um, they're more likely to feel intrigued when they encounter something that, that contradicts their expectations. Scouts also have different values. They're more likely to say that uh, they think it's virtuous to test your own beliefs, and they're less likely to say that someone who changes his mind seems weak. And above all, scouts are grounded, which means that their self-worth as a person isn't tied to how right or wrong they are about any particular topic. So, you know, they can believe that capital punishment works, uh, and if studies come out showing that it doesn't, they can say, huh, looks like I might be wrong. Doesn't mean I'm bad or stupid, you know? So these traits, this cluster of traits, is what researchers have found, uh, and I've also found anecdotally, predicts good judgment. Um, and the key takeaway I want to leave you with about those traits is that they're primarily not about how smart you are or about how much you know. Uh, in fact, they don't correlate very much with IQ at all. Um, they're about how you feel. So there's a quote that I keep coming back to by Saint Exupéry. He's the author of The Little Prince. And he said, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up your men to collect wood and, and give orders and distribute the work. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. In other words, I claim, if we want to really improve our judgment as, as individuals and as societies, what we need most is not more instruction in logic or rhetoric or probability or economics, even though those things are quite valuable. Um, but what we most need to use those principles well is scout mindset. We need to change the way we feel. We need to learn how to feel proud instead of ashamed when we notice we might have been wrong about something. We need to learn how to feel intrigued instead of defensive when we encounter some information that contradicts uh, our beliefs. So the question I want to leave you with is, what do you most yearn for? Do you yearn to defend your own beliefs? Or do you yearn to see the world as clearly as you possibly can? Thank you. So that's the gist of Julia's talk. I was pretty well received. And she's been working on a book on the topic, actually, which I think is due out sometime in 2020. It's not available yet. Um, there's a lot in the soldier scout distinction that I like. It maps on to many of the themes in my own work. Looking back over my Argument Ninja podcast archives, I can see I did an episode back in 2016 on the topic of curiosity and the role of curiosity as a resource for critical thinking. A lot of the same themes came up. I talked about the psychology of curiosity, uh, curiosity as a personality trait versus what psychologists call situational curiosity, how curiosity can be cultivated, and so on. This distinction here is particularly important, I think. 
It's the distinction between what I called partisan interest and genuine curiosity. Partisan interest is the interest that arises naturally out of the soldier mindset. It's grounded in the desire to acquire information and arguments that can help you pursue a particular partisan objective, like defending one side of an issue or criticizing an opposing side. But genuine curiosity is an interest that arises naturally out of the scout mindset. It's oriented towards discovering the truth, whatever the truth happens to be. And that kind of curiosity actually has debiasing effects. It can help to mitigate the distorting effects of motivated reasoning and other cognitive biases. And looking down the show notes page, I see I did in fact link to Julia's video in the show notes. Now this all connects in various ways with my own work on critical thinking and tribal psychology and polarization. The soldier mindset is one that is dominated by a tribal psychology. It affects what we think is right and wrong, and what we think is true or false, and rational and irrational. And our tribal identities play a huge role in determining how we think and feel about issues that matter to the group and who to trust. Now, in my work, I focused more on the ways that polarization drives tribal thinking and how a healthy tribal psychology uh, can become pathological as polarization increases. So in this sketchbook video I did, the little dial on the right is supposed to represent a polarization meter, and it measures how different we think we are from one another, how strongly we draw a distinction between us and them. And at low levels of polarization, we can get along fine. We can have productive conversations even where we disagree. We can even have lifelong friendships with people with whom we have long-standing disagreements. But at higher levels of polarization, it's harder and harder to do this. We become more emotionally invested in one side of the issue. Conversations are harder to manage. As polarization increases, common ground decreases. It's harder to find areas of agreement that could help us resolve or help negotiate a dispute. And at the same time, it becomes harder for us to see one another as rational or moral agents. I find it harder and harder to imagine how a rational good person could think the way that you do. And so we get situations like this, where a politically charged event is interpreted so differently by, say, liberal versus conservative sides, with such negative emotion attached to it, we're convinced the other side must be evil, or mentally disturbed, or in the grip of some ideology that is brainwashing them, that has blinded them. So in a few of my videos, I've laid out a story about the various psychological and social mechanisms that contribute to this pathological mindset. I won't get into the details here, but the view that I've argued for is that strong identification with any kind of political or philosophical ideology makes it harder to think critically about those issues. In Julia's terms, it promotes a soldier's mindset that is hostile to critical thinking. Now, I've discovered that this idea isn't new by any means. Listen to anything by Jonathan Haidt. Over the past few years, he holds many of the same views. I actually titled one of my videos, How Politics Makes Us Mean and Stupid. And then I go online afterwards and I find this article by Jason Brennan from 2017 called Politics Makes Us Mean and Dumb. So it's very much in the same vein. It's talking about the distorting effects of cognitive biases and tribal psychology. I particularly appreciated this quote that uh, Jason Brennan uses in the article. It's from the economist Joseph Schumpeter, and he wrote this in the early 20th century. The typical citizen drops down to a lower level of mental performance as soon as he enters the political field. He argues and analyzes in a way which he would readily recognize as infantile within the sphere of his real interest. He becomes a primitive again. So this is not a new idea. This is all just set up for a conversation that I'd like to have this weekend about this picture of human nature, what it means for those of us who want to develop our critical thinking skills, who want to become better critical thinkers in areas that we really care about. Like, here are some questions. Is this a zero-sum game? If I want to be a scout, do I have to give up being a soldier? But what if I care about both? What if I care a lot about a particular issue, and I want to advocate for it, and I want to have the most clear-eyed understanding of the facts, is this even possible? And if it is, what's the strategy for negotiating the tension between these two mindsets? Also, from an argument ninja philosophy standpoint, I can't help but think in terms of the categories that I've developed over the years about the complementarity of argument 
in the service of knowledge and truth on the one hand, and argument in the service of social persuasion on the other hand. Is the scout mindset the yang to the soldier mindset's yin? Are they mutually complementary in some important way? But if so, how does this actually play out in practice? I think these are important questions. And finally, here's a question I think is maybe the most important. Is there a special role for communities like ours in helping us to improve the quality of our judgment and our reasoning, even if, as individuals, we have as much soldier in us as scout in us? I think maybe there is, but again, I'd like to talk about this. So that's the setup. For Argument Ninja Dojo members, I'll circulate an email with the link to Julie's video and the link to the Zoom meeting on Saturday. Now, if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube or wherever, and you're not already an Argument Ninja Dojo member, but you'd like to participate in discussions like this, you should visit argumentninja.com and take a look at the community link. The Argument Ninja Dojo is a membership site that gives you access to community meetings like these that we hold every two weeks, plus a discussion forum, uh, plus a ton of video course content. The site is run on a pay what you want monthly subscription model, starting as low as $3 a month, so please check that out if you're interested. And to the dojo members, we'll see you on Saturday, I hope.